All right. Another Monday. Here we go. All day. Here we are. I'm tired today. <laughs> Me too. And I'm, I'm getting sick too. I, I was just reading a, uh, a a question from one of our fans. Um, Gay guy? Wisconsin? No, no, okay. not him. Not, yeah, actually him, but it's a, it's a regular question. Hey, uh, we are Power and Speed, 908-751-0211. You nutless fuckers aren't going to call in anyway, <laughs> so whatever. Oh, shit. Yeah, Luke, there, there's time for you to call in Yeah, right. Be, before we get our caller, so do it now. Remember, like us, share us, iTunes, all the other fun places, Facebook, you know. He's using a little little boy voice again. I know, maybe, I know. Maybe. He goes back and forth. Might have got the balls yeah, hanging yeah, off whatever. his chin, yeah. fucking stuck in one of the You know, and one person here. Uh, Hold on, I got, I got to ask you. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not exactly the pillar of fashion. Mm-hmm. But what is that set of fucking balls growing off your face? What is that supposed to be? It's like you took two shrubs and planted them on either side of your chin. Is there a fashion term for that? I'm just asking. I don't feel like shaving. And that happens to be the only place that hair grows on your face? Sure, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> Tom? I don't, I'm, 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 and Danzig I'm, doesn't have a mustache, so I don't know where that came from. But because anyway. we just heard a Danzig song and realized how bad they were. Mm-hmm. Um. Is the phone system on? Yes, it is. Okay. It is. Why? The people are pouring in with calls? <clears throat> yeah. No, I think Luke's going to, I think Luke's going to call. Yeah, you got to give him a few minutes to figure out how to work a phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's that rotary thing still. They're not that hard. The one Ooh. thing that I want to talk about is uh, I got all the literature from Banish and I, I believe that somebody like Scott North or somebody posted that I'm back on Facebook. I don't know where you get that from <laughs> because that that's a, a no. Um, he was hopeful. Yeah. I told... Uh, I told Tad to post pictures, all the the stuff he sent. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through that piece by piece. Uh, kind of did the same thing with Ben. You know, Ben got a set up on the, on the learning side of things. So yeah. I went through it and told everybody what I think. But I will say this, that I jumped immediately ahead to what I was interested in. You know, just mm-hmm. like put the second disc in mm-hmm. or the uh, advanced tuning. There's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah. I can tell you in like, uh, probably five or 10 minutes of viewing it. There's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah. Well, Banish is a super genius. So I think, you know, kind of a little bit. Yeah. But what it did is it, it fixed a, a lot of, it, it answered a lot of questions for you in five minutes of watching. I think it answered 10 of the, the most glaring questions I had. What do you talk about toasters or something? No, <laughs> oh. no, we can, Waffle we can talk about toasters. I know. I, I know you have, I know you have questions about toasters. Though. Well versed on the toaster. I know you are. I know you are. Toaster Performance Index, TPI. Yeah, that's it. Right. Oh God! Um, but that that his his video, uh, I I'm not going to say it's too early to say, but I can tell you from the little bit that I watched, this will real would help probably anybody that works with a stock computer. From the people that I've talked to about stock computers, most of them could benefit from this too. Sure, there's an awful lot here. So, but I, I think he's going to call in like at the end of the show, he's swimming or something. So after he's done, he's going to call him. All right, we got Luke here. Hang on. Hey, Luke, how are you? Good. How's it going? Are you wearing a scarf? Uh, no, that's just Tom. Okay, just checking. <laughs> Luke. Yes. What's your question? Mike, no, I have info. Oh, good. Far away. <laughs> so, I am friends with some of the uh, like the creators of that Cod Snow Prep that I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. He's lying around and good friends uh, thing. He's got <laughs> but uh trent is one of them and trent just went live on facebook tonight giving some information to people that are kind of into the whole no prep thing and kind of something that might be changing the face of no prep is kind of like we've known it for the past 10 or 15 years it's been around really but yeah so street outlaws is coming off with like uh like kind of a segue show called the kings of no prep yeah i've and seen that yeah yeah so What's been going on is a lot of people have been contacting Trent of all people asking him, like, how do we do a no prep? Because all these people are really doing this. I mean, they're kind of in it for the money because no prep is cool right now. So they've actually started putting together not a sanctioning body, but an organization called National No Prep Association. And what the purpose of it is, is kind of to help out the whole no prep crowd and make this thing successful because obviously there's been at least one track that's closed down this year and is drag racers. Nobody wants to see tracks closed down. So 
if they can do this and keep tracks open and keep tracks making money, I mean, it's going to do nothing but help the sport no matter how much people don't like street outlaws or whatever. So um, that should be kind of hitting the media within the next month or so. So if you guys are, if any of the listeners are interested in no prep stuff, kind of something to keep in your view and support it when you see it. Hmm. Well said, Luke. Yeah, pretty good. How Mike's much they pay your dumb ass to do that? Yeah, Mike's been telling me for 15 minutes what an idiot you are. That yeah. sounds, sounds pretty uh, good. Whatever, Cohesive. You know? It was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't bad. Whatever. Oh, he's spoken whole sentences. Yeah, um, I, but as far as tracks closing, I mean, Tom and I were just having a, a, a brief discussion before we came on air. I don't know that no prep would have saved a place like English Town. No, it wouldn't have. I, I don't. Right. I, nope. Yeah. You know what the problem is? Everybody, and, and I don't, man, here we go. Off on a, offending a lot of people stuff. <laughs> here in New Jersey, we are, I would say, very civilized, like as far as our way of life and what people expect and the level of entitlement of people in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. So a place like Englishtown to exist without financial problems is almost impossible. And and now we have the offer of this company that was going to take it over. That's yep. that's pretty severe. Yeah, I don't think anything would have fixed it here. No, Wouldn't but I mean, if tracks are closing in the hole in the wall areas, like where do we go? Do we go to Byron? Yeah, I mean that's like a small little hole in the wall area. Yep, I don't think that'll ever close. I don't. I, I wouldn't hope. think they would ever close. Why would they? I would no. think that they make a couple bucks a, a weekend and they're good. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I don't disagree with that, but yeah. Okay. All well, right. that's good info. Well, if you want to get the no prep guy on here, you know, do you know the guy or did you just see the guy yeah, or are you like yeah, a groupie or what's your deal? Yeah, no, he's a friend of mine. I can talk to him, see right. if he's interested in getting on here. Yeah, tell him to come on. I mean, we got a large audience. A lot of people get reached right away, so I think it'd be pretty good. We'll do it. Right then. Yeah, I'll talk to him. We'll uh, just tell him how much he's got to pay us and where, and we're, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll just have him pay me. It's all good. Oh, yeah, that'll work. Well, I'm sure he's doing that, yeah. all that no prep stuff for nothing, right? Sure. Just for the love of the game. <laughs> Yeah. Right, yeah. right, Luke. Right. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's yeah, my yeah. that's my cynical side. You know what cynical you means, right? You too well. You're speaking through your scarf. Yeah, I, I got to ask you, Luke. How's the married life, buddy? You all good? You know, it's good exactly with the same. Everybody keeps asking me that. But good, exactly the same. No, I, I mean that. You know, that wasn't sarcastic. I meant it. You know, like well, see how you were doing. So good. Yeah, it's good. All right, all right, buddy. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem, guys. Talk see to you. Later. All right, man. Bye bye. Bye. Poor guy. When do you get married? Well, it couldn't have been that long ago if it's still okay. <laughs> I <laughs> mean, it's a matter of time. <laughs> and, and you're the cynical one, right? Was he married when we saw him? No. So it was it was recent. Yeah, it was real recent. Okay. I mean, it was within the last, you know, couple months or so. Tad, but, Google that. Google what? Nothing, Tad. It's nice he's paying attention. Yeah, I know. He? Yeah, you're he's busy over there day. grooming his balls. Yeah. <sighs> so uh, I, anyway, back to the banished thing. Um, I think what I want to do, uh, I'm going to get you, if uh, if I get you a way to watch this, are you actually going to watch it or no? Yeah. I'll or would it. that be like asking too much? Hell no. I'll watch it. Okay. I want to watch it. Because we should, we should go a little more in depth about this, you know, cause this, this is a lot of stuff. Yeah. There's, uh, I think there's three DVDs, four DVDs and a double Blu-ray. Wow. It's a lot of stuff. I'd, I, I would no doubt watch, definitely watch it. Okay. I think it's going to be fun. That's actually good airplane stuff. Yeah, that'd be good for you. When are you going anywhere again? Uh, I'm going to Dubai in in, uh, in end of March. Okay. Yeah, I don't have anything scheduled to go anywhere. So. Why don't you go to Dubai? Yeah. Anyway, it's a little far for me, dude. True. A little out of my comfort zone. I, I'm not. I don't, I'm not thinking that'd be so great. Hey, so let's talk about tonight. Um, we got uh, Mark Conti from Real Street. Mm-hmm. He's going to be a good guest. He's pretty. He's a smart cat. I see now. Primarily, and I don't mean this is all they do, mm-hmm. but they're they're kind of most well known for two Jay Z stuff, right? Yeah. Um, you guys, Manly, worked on piston programs for all those things and everything else. I mean, you have a lot of involvement with that, don't you? Yeah. Yep. All right. Is that where was that? Who's did you test? Yeah. That's the test motor. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, made eighteen hundred fifty horsepower. My God, yep, that was a lot of fun. We got we're do uh, we we're supposed to do that again. 
uh, to make over 2000. Uh, I don't know when that's going to happen or even if, but, uh, that was a lot of fun. And that video got a lot of views, like a lot. How big was that motor? Uh, three, I think it was a three liter. Now nah, it might've been a three, four. Wow. Yeah. It's not that, that small. They're yep. Crazy, right? Yeah. You think about that. The power per inch or something like that. Aren't these the things that we were talking to? Did we talk to Jay about it? That it's like 60 something pounds of boost. 52. That one was. And we didn't, he didn't want to go higher because uh, it had stock head studs. Yeah. It, it did that mm. with like stock head studs. Yes, sir. My God. Yeah. Well, but the the reason to bring up the two Jay-Z stuff, they do everything. It is not like you were talking about the cars that they all owned collectively a, as a, as a shop. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they do. Well, they're, you know, they primarily are, um, part sales guys. Right. They have a big operation. They're very, very knowledgeable, uh, which is why they're so good. But they also do hands-on stuff too. Don't oh they? yeah. Yeah. They have a whole shop. They have a chassis dyno. I mean, is this, do they do that as a, and maybe we're talking more we should talk to him about it but is that an integral part to their business or is it primarily part sales like do they are they selective for their work or they only take on projects they want or how does it work well i mean that'd be a better question for him but but i think uh they're they're way more primarily um part sales okay and they do that you know they do a lot of r&d and and that kind of stuff sells parts and um you know they're 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 in a lot of stuff Okay. And, and they, they're, they're good at everything to do. Yeah. Exactly. I think must be, is this Mark? Yep. Hey, you're on the air, buddy. Hey Mark. How are you? Hey, how you doing? Oh, we've been waiting. We've been talking all kind of good shit about you. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah. So, well, don't let me interrupt you. <laughs> no, we needed you for the real info. We we're just making shit up. That might work. So <laughs> I could. So, um, we were just telling the, the fans or whoever's listening people, uh, what you guys do primarily and, um, you know, how into cars you are. We didn't tell any of the story. Uh, you want to give us a short version of, of where real street came from? Oh boy. Um, don't go back to like, uh, you know, God created the heaven and the earth. (laughs) Just, you know, just the cliff uh, notes. The, the the four partners all worked uh, in the industry previously, and then in uh, 2007, Jay and I got together and uh, opened up the, uh, well, Jay, uh, Jay opened it, then he called me a couple months later, and then we opened up the original iteration of what Real Street is, and it actually was a Mustang performance shop. That's where, uh, that's the stuff that Jay knows. He worked on Mustangs for 10, 15 years before that. Um, the name Real Street uh, Performance actually came from NMRA Real Street. He used to race in that class with his buddy John O'Brien. Um, <clears throat> so that is the origin of the name. But um, so we came together, and he was working on cars, and I kind of added the uh, business management component and then the part sales side because that's what I knew. Uh, well, you know, that's what I was doing at the time. And so uh, a year and a half after that, we, uh, we partnered up with uh, Geo and Clay, and that was kind of the four-headed monster that started things off, and then we were adding people along the way. So uh, Geo is Geo's like this sales machine. He's very good on the phone. He has great customer service. He's, uh, he he. He, everybody just basically has a different uh, a different skill set. So I was pretty good with the money side, and Clay was very good with the marketing and the IT, and then Gia's very good with the customers and the sales itself, and then G, uh, Jay was able to do basically everything else that's hands-on. Yeah, it's amazing how four guys get together and actually have you know the skill sets that are so perfectly blended to do it all. It, it, it's quite an amazing story. Who was the, who was the two Jay-Z guy? Like who, who led real street in I that think, direction? Well, I, I'm guessing, but I think they all are. Yeah. Really? I mean, Mark, yeah, ha- Mark you, know, you have a couple of them, right? Uh, we all are. Uh, I've had, I've had five Supras at this point, uh, five or six. Jay's had two or three himself. Uh, Clay has a Supra currently. Um, 
Uh, Geo's had, I think, three of them. So we, we've all we've all had them, and then a handful of employees have also had them here. So we all were involved in the 2JZ itself, but um, you know that's only one. That's that's only the engine that we do a lot of development work on. Uh, we're not uh, solely focused on one engine. Oh yeah, we were talking about that. Yeah. You, you guys do everything. Uh, in fact, I was just getting to telling Mike that um, you've branched out into you know uh, domestic stuff. You know, Geo's got a vet, and Clay's got a CTSV. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's, you know, moving that way now for the business, I guess, cause it has to, right? Well, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, say that it has to move that way. Like you can, if you ever feel like you have a segment completely locked up, you're probably going backwards. Like you can't be complacent. There's always a way that we can, uh, serve people better. Uh, we, I'm not going to go into all of the things that we have planned, but we have a bunch of really cool stuff coming up uh, for a bunch of different markets, import, domestic, um, uh, all kind of all over the board. But the way that we, the way that we went about it in the beginning, and we honestly continue to do the same thing is that we try to have controlled uh, and organic methodical growth. So we don't, like you would know this, Tom, we don't go and open up a hundred different lines just so we can have a big line card and sell to a bunch of people and then hope that we accidentally get some sales from some search engine results. We, we started with engine internals, your pistons, your rods, your bearings, your camshafts, this and that. And then we expanded out to uh, engine management and fuel systems and then turbocharging and boost control. Uh, and then from there, we went to drivetrain, you know, add some axles, clutches, rear ends, and all that fun stuff, uh, engine management on top of that, and then, you know, added some wheels, and then we will essentially try to duplicate that in the next segment, which um, I consider OBD2 domestic, so 96 and up type deal. Uh, and we just, the, the way that we do it is we, make sure that we actually are providing a value. So I don't want, I shouldn't say I, we all don't want to go into a market that we don't have anything to give to the community. So the company is very, is very uh, adamant about making sure that we're actually providing a value. More than just shipping a box, we want to make sure that we're giving you information or helping you make a decision or or leading you down the right path. So if I don't know, then I'm not going to come in there and try to get your money because that's just not how we do it here. Um, there are other businesses that facilitate the simple logistics end, and they don't have a value add on the um, on the information side, and that's perfectly fine. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with those businesses. It's just not what our business is built on. Yep. Yep. Our business is built on actually trying to provide you information so that you can make decisions yourself and so that you can, you can, you know, be empowered to, to know that you're making the right decision. You know, all these guys that are either building their first car, you know, the kids coming up or somebody that's finally gotten to a point financially where they can go and do a car. It's intimidating. You don't want to, you don't want to spend money and get it wrong. You know, it's a very complex system. There's, hundreds of parts that you're looking at to purchase that you could easily get one of them wrong. And it's a catastrophic failure. And the internet so. is actually a very bad place to try to do research and get accurate answers. I mean, you need, if, if I was looking for answers, I'd want to talk to somebody that this is what they do. You know, that not, not just the, the, the village wisdom as somebody just told me the other day, it's not what you're looking for. It's really tough because, you know, you have to figure out signal from noise, right? And the issue is that as soon as the random guy standing in his grocery store parking lot hears something, even if he didn't hear it the way he thinks he did, he has decided that he is now a subject matter expert and he will regurgitate it with a, a lot of authority. And so he'll say it as if it's fact, as if it's been written in the scrolls and this is the way that it works. And so 
anyone else out there reading, if you say it with authority, you, you know, the new guy will tend to agree with it. Why would he listen to someone else? You know, why wouldn't he listen to somebody that says it as if there's no wiggle room? Mm -hmm. So it, it is kind of difficult. And I, I've seen a lot of posts like that on Facebook that are well-written, um, somewhat lengthy, detailed, and completely categorically wrong. Yeah. There, there's just, there's yeah. no, no other way it could be spun. There's no opinion about this. It's wrong. And people, uh, I would like to think that if people are reading social media, trying to get information, they're going to pick hopefully the more, I want to say educated sounding posts and well-written posts. And, and that that's becoming a problem in this business. It really is. So to have it, it, people that you can talk to, to buy parts from that really know what they're talking about, that's, that's really valid. Yeah. And, and yeah, exactly. That, that's basically, that's basically what we try to do in a nutshell. And, and that's why we are very slow to move into different markets. Um, all of our salespeople here, we call them build advisors because they're all extremely high quality technical people. Um, you have to go through some screening even before you get to an interview process here to show conceptual knowledge not just you know what parts to sell for uh, a Civic SI or you know what parts to sell for a Mustang. It's conceptual knowledge like the fuel system requirements between gasoline and ethanol, uh, sizing a turbocharger, uh, what a wastegate does. You have to have conceptual functional knowledge because the concept is really the key. And that's why, in reality, we can, we can use the 2JZ and, it, and the concept still translates to the guy with the 1.6D series. It translates to the guy with the LS1. It translates everywhere because it's, you know, it could be what a turbocharger does, or it could be how camshafts work. It could be how, you know, any variety of things works. And, and the, con the concept is what you're able to take and then move forward with and figure out what you want to do. It doesn't have to be, that we're testing uh, higher compression in an LS1. If we test higher compression in a Honda K20, the the concept you can still understand. You can still work with the concept and figure out roughly what it's going to do in your LS1. Got it. Um, damn, I got I, I got so many things flying by me on the on the chat room. Um, so. After all the parts delivery stuff and all the quality added stuff, you guys are still um, car guys and experts in a lot of things. Um, where did you get your, um, you know, where did you learn what you know uh, about the 2J, about racing, about turbos, about all the stuff? Just uh, where did it come from? Well, I, um, me personally, I just try to be a student and a sponge. And I just absorb and absorb and absorb, and then I'll basically do what Mike was just talking about, where I'll find the guy that has said enough right things that I'm like, okay, I need to pay attention from, I need to pay attention on what this guy's saying. And I try to translate what I'm getting into conceptual things so that I, I feel like once, once you do understand the concept, then you're able to, you're able to uh, learn quicker. So I do the same thing with business, with cars, engines, racing, what have you. Um, so I was the, the kid in, you know, junior high school and high school, just reading on, reading on forums because there was no Facebook back then, just reading on forums, reading, 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 uh, trying to go to races and events and talk to the racers. And one thing that's cool, the, really the only thing that's cool about being substantially young and trying to get into cars is at the races, the guys that are racing are really cool and they'll be happy to tell you, to teach you and learn. The ironic part is that when you go to the car show and you try to talk to an owner of a car, it seems to not work that way for some reason. Yeah. But at the races, everybody is more than happy to teach this young teenager how things work. So I just tried to get a huge composite of information and build this, you know, stockpile of info that I could wade through. And so I'm pretty good at remembering numbers. So once I was able to kind of understand how everything worked, then it kind of fell into place that I would 
almost be good at helping to uh, pick out parts. You know, once you know how camshaft duration and lift works, you can start helping people almost regardless of what engine it is. Same thing with turbocharging. Um, you know, it's th that's really how I got started. And so out of college, I started my own business, not really knowing what I was going to do, doing part sales because people were asking me, you know, hey, can you help me with my car? And this is just for me posting advice on forums. And so then another, uh, a bigger uh, distributor that I was a customer of asked me to come work for them. So I did. They had a race team. I worked on the race team for a bit. And then um, after I left there is when we started Real Street. So, yeah, that, yeah that's a. Uh... I, I know who that is and yeah, that was all good experience. And, uh, I do, I agree with what you're saying about the racing group. Um, it's kind of refreshing to, to go to a race and talk to people because it's cool and that they will tell you, it seems like they'll tell you too much. Uh, like you walk away. Yeah, And it's almost like the cooler and mo and faster the car, the more they'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really neat. Um, yeah. well, listen, I Does know that really happened. Cause like I, I'd kind of keep my mouth shut. Unless that's a circle track not in, in me. It happens. Circle track or super stock or something. <laughs> no, it definitely happens. You're a, well, yeah, well, you got, well, you, well, you're an engine builder, a, a professional. Yeah, I don't so. talk to anybody unless they're, you know, at, you know, the, the, the point of purchase yeah. <laughs> would, would be like where I talk to them. No, I, I see that. But, yeah, but, but if you were, if you were at a racetrack, your, your second or third best crew guy probably told me everything. Yeah. yeah, well, we all sucked, so yeah. really, really didn't matter who was talking too much. There weren't a lot of people hawking over what we were doing, that's yeah, for sure. True. Um, but I, I think I agree a lot what he said, that foundationally, uh, compression is compression, boost is boost, uh, be behaviors are behaviors. I would think the cause and effect relationship, for the most part, would hold true throughout just about any internal combustion engine. So the foundational properties right. to have them, you know, the the... The correct foundation is really important here. Right. Like, like I am, I am not an LS expert, but I can absolutely have a conversation. Like if, if you were asking me what cylinder head to use, I couldn't answer you. And I'm not going to get into that because I know you guys have a thing, <laughs> all, you know, but, uh, but it's all point, Tom's fault. He's I, very stubborn, very stubborn one, but I could tell you, I could tell you about the concepts of volumetric efficiency. I could tell you about, you know, camshafts and, and runner length and the way that normal things work, you know, uh, rod length, uh, piston dwell, all that stuff. It, it translates. It doesn't really matter what engine you're talking about. I mean, and then the other thing is when you have somebody that really is revved up about what the numbers are supposed to mean, you can translate it with real world, world data. It's like, well, if you went purely by mass, then no big block Chevy would ever be fast because the numbers are terrible, but the, they just work. So, you know, the, the, the ability to, to mesh what the, uh, what the concepts are with real world data is kind of important. Yep. Well, you know, uh, all that stuff you mentioned, uh, we're experts at, we don't need to know any about, uh, about any of that stuff, but we want to know about turbochargers. That's what, that's what Mike's been wanting right. to know about. We're not experts at that. I've been sitting here thinking, <laughs> how do I start filtering in turbo questions into this conversation? Well, I just lied about knowing everything to get you into the turbo <laughs> conversation. Cause that's, hey. it, that's one thing. I mean, you know, from, from a guy who was never involved in the turbocharger side of things, when you really start to look at all the different parameters to go into a unit, it, it get it's a little daunting. I mean, you know, like, like trying to pick this up and I have tried to read some forums and some information, excuse me, some information, but it's kind of tough. Um, I've gotten varying opinions on turbine housings. I've gotten varying opinions on AR ratio, and it seems like they're all exactly that mostly opinions. Now it, it I, I mean, I, I don't know where to start to even ask questions like basically like turbine housing, What's the effect of AR uh, on a given housing? Why does it do what it does? Okay. Well, basically, um, think about trying to turn over a, flan a fan blade with air, right? Mm -hmm. If you're turning over a fan blade with air, even just using your mouth, pushing past the fan blade, like imagine you had a pinwheel from a, from a fair back in the day. 
if you're way off at the edge of it, it'll turn, but not very well. Then if you blow directly on one of the blades, it turns sooner, really fast, etc. Well, any, any fan or turbine has a certain amount of air it can move. Well, air has to change direction. So if you blow right against the wheel, it has to change direction. And hard, you know, it has a, a rougher change to get out of that turbine. So if you can give it a softer, a softer angle to impact the turbine wheel and to turn back out of the downpipe, well, not only does the system have more mass in it or, or more volume in it so that it just you know it simply has more volume in it but the the fact that you're not you're not as tight against the turbine is going to allow that turbine wheel to move more air like if you ever look at a turbine map it just simply can move a higher volume of uh of air and fuel okay so would this um would a way to picture this be say an air hose blowing directly across that fan and the angle of the fan might give you more speed, but less power um, and more direct because there's more torque. There's more torque against the turbine wheel with a tighter AR. Got it. So you can, you can twist the turbo and bring the turbo online sooner. You can get more shaft RPM sooner with a smaller AR. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the objective people try to do with a, smaller AR is they'll try and tighten everything around it so that it impacts the turbine wheel as aggressively as possible and with the most torque to get the system online. Now what I imagine the opposite side of that would be is that if you were doing something to bring it online sooner, then the overall volume you could pass through that housing has to be way down and the amount of power, uh, you know, that uh, I want to say the amount of volume because that you can't, I know how I'm trying to say this conceptually and I don't know how to say it. Um, no, I get what you're. I get what you're saying. You're, and, and you're right. That's the point. Is that uh, is that if you were to give this very small uh, AR that brings the turbo online very quickly, you do exactly that, and you choke the turbine. There's only so much air that gets through it before it starts stacking up more and more pressure behind behind the turbine wheel, and then it affects the. Uh, air behind the exhaust valve and then it can't clear the chamber and then you make less power. VE goes down, blah, 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 blah. So, so it's all efficiency exactly really, right? What's that? It's all efficiency really. It's, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the old adage of engine is an air pump holds true here. You're trying to get as much air in and as much air out. So in a perfect world, if you had a supercharger that wasn't, parasitic against engine power to come online and you could rev it up over what the step up ratio was, then you'd have a back pressure list turbo because you could just put a set of manifolds on it and have at it. But the turbocharger, while it has all these upsides of being able to turn it up, turn it down, etc., it has the lag and it has the, uh, has the exhaust pressure situation. So yeah. when you reach the end of what you can do on a particular combo from an exhaust pressure standpoint, you have two, you have two options. One, you can either enlarge the turbine housing and increase flow that way, or two, you can move up to a larger turbine wheel. Well, a lot of people like to move up to a larger turbine wheel when that might not always be the right way to do it because a larger turbine wheel has more mass. The larger AR doesn't have more mass, it just has more volume. So it, it oftentimes, not every time, because it depends on what you have available to you, but oftentimes you can get the power you're looking for by just simply changing a turbine housing to one that has a number you're not very comfortable with, like say a 128 or a 139 AR. It sounds huge and everybody gets scared, but you're still dealing with a lighter, smaller turbine wheel. So sometimes that's a better choice than moving up in turbine wheel size with another small turbine housing. But that is definitely not a blanket statement. It's yeah. application specific. Because that's as we were talking about that, I was like, okay, then what is the difference between 
uh, altering the AR, altering the the size of the physical, you know, wheel and and operating structure. But that that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's basic. It's basically mass. You know, if you you're sitting there holding that pinwheel, right? And you blow into it, it turns really easy. Well, now if you hold a if you hold a fan, the same amount of air going against it from your lungs is not going to turn it very well. So when you make that turbine wheel larger, it's more mass to deal with. You know, moment of inertia isn't. It's the turbochargers don't just get get away with magic. It's you know, it's the same stuff that you're used to. If you put a big, heavy wheel on a car, the car is slower. It's harder to turn over. Same thing with a turbine wheel. Yep. Hey, if, if, if you know, or if you have one, what is the best way, or what is the way that you um, figure out this, what size turbine housing you need to start off with without, being, without buying, you know, six or eight or ten turbos? Uh, well, when you, can, uh, when you can get a turbine map, you can try and... You can try and plot it, but really at this point, I just base it off of what I know has worked somewhere else, mm. uh, and I can I can generally get pretty close. Um, I know that doesn't help the the lay person trying to get involved um, and pick on their own. But if you call us with your you know with your question, I can generally get you close. And sometimes me getting you close involves me calling somebody that has your application and saying, Hey, what did you see with this? And then I come back to you with an answer, but, um, it's not a great answer, but since turbine maps are so few and far between at this point, I don't really try to base what I tell you based on those. Um, not only that, but the companies that do provide turbine maps, half of the housings that get sold for those turbines aren't their housings anyway. So it's really tough to use. Yeah. Yep. See that this is the way I was thinking about this is like Tom and I we were talking about turbochargers and output, and I I think and correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it kind of misleading to say a turbocharger is capable of supporting this much horsepower because horsepower is a calculation based on RPM. So I mean, uh, yeah, I mean to a point because uh, airflow. You you could you could try and pick a constant for airflow. You know, what what did Corky Bell say? It was like ten point eight seven per pound or something like that. Uh, you you could roughly do it, but the reality of what you're saying is correct because of RPM. Like a a given turbocharger will make more on a Honda or a four G six three Mitsubishi than it will on a two JZ, which will make more than it will on an LS, which mm-hmm. will make more than it will on a small block Ford. You know and so on and so forth. Well, like when, if you were sizing, like trying to figure out the cross between a turbocharger, like if I was looking at, let's say, and, and this, and look, if you don't want to talk about this stuff, that's fine. Like if we figure we're getting off on a, Ah. on a trail here, let's say you had uh, a six liter motor and you had one four cylinder that happened to be a three liter. Can yep. you look at that three liter that maybe makes its peak horsepower of say 800 horsepower at, I don't know, 9,000 yeah. RPM. And can you draw any conclusions to putting say a pair of those on a six liter motor that needs to make say 1600 horsepower, but needs to make it down at 6,500 It is yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, the, the, it, it won't be the formula one level answer. But it it will absolutely get you in the ballpark. Yeah, if because you had something that was, if you had something that was working well at nine thousand RPM, making power good. Like really, the really the important part is pressure ratio. The turbo needs to be able to support your airflow requirement or your horsepower requirement. So if you need seventy five to eighty pounds a minute of turbocharger, then can the turbine wheel keep up with what the boost pressure is going to yield? So if your if your three liter makes for easy argument here, we'll call it four hundred horsepower just because it'd be easy math. So if it makes four hundred horsepower and then you put a atmosphere boost in it, which is fourteen point five, and then it makes eight hundred horsepower, okay, what's the what's the exhaust pressure? If you, the exhaust pressure is Again, for easy conversation, 14. 
thumbs up, move forward, put two of them on a six liter, you're going to be pretty close. If the, if the uh, exhaust pressure rate ratio is all out of whack, like if it takes 29 pounds of exhaust pressure to make that 14.5 pounds of boost, then both engines would be wrong with that turbocharger mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. pair of turbochargers. Yeah, that makes sense. It does. So it's, it's the size of the engine is the size of the engine, but the, the VE will change, uh, and, and, and yeah, make different power, but it's going to yeah, be in the basically ballpark. when, when you have, when you have valve overlap, you've got, you've got pressure, you've got pressure in the intake track. You've got pressure in the exhaust track. It will really any substantial pressure in the exhaust track is going to hurt cylinder clearing, you know, the ability to get the air out of the cylinder that's going to shrink your dynamic compression ratio, which you guys probably know about. But if anyone listening does not know what that is, dynamic compression ratio is the effective compression ratio of when the valve closes or the valves close and where the piston is. So the piston's on its way up the bore. It has essentially shrank the size of engine you're working with. So the dynamic compression ratio is very important. And if you shrink that further with burnt up exhaust gases that couldn't get out of the chamber, then you're further shrinking your engine. Yep. And that's when you're going to see the torque really fall off. So you can see it from the compressor wheel not keeping up, but if the turbine wheel is not keeping up and stuffing exhaust or not letting the cylinder clear, that's when the torque's really going to nose over on a turbo car. Mm -hmm. That's good real world information too. Yeah, it does. A lot of people don't think of that. Um, Hey, I, we got to change gears for one second. I know you want to keep on turbos, but, but I promised. <laughs> now the, the problem is, is it, it's such, it's such an involved subject. And I mean, I guess somebody that does it all the time, you know, what it, it, it gets easier, you yeah. know, you get more familiar, but as a guy who just started looking at them like six months ago and looking at them half heartedly, maybe a little longer, Yep. but it, it's tough to absorb all this stuff when you haven't been around it. And I've tried, like I said, I've tried to read forum posts and, I've seen everything that I could immediately identify as incorrect to things that I had to really research to see if it was the right information. It's tough. Mm -hmm. It's really good to talk to what somebody. You're describing, what you're describing is really the almost the, the prototypical, the billboard example of what our company exists to help with. Yeah. It's overwhelming. Like I went, uh, I just got a seven, three diesel mm -hmm. and my I'm man. just sitting there trying to learn, just trying to learn. I don't know much about diesels. I understand engines. I don't know that truck, you know, so I'm sitting there trying to learn everything from what's interchangeable. Okay, the front axle changes to no five, blah, 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 blah. Well, when you can find a subject matter expert that you can ask, like I have this buddy on Facebook, Dan Grimm, and I asked him, and he knows all the stuff about these things. And so he sits there and he helps me. Uh, you know, this is what you need to do here, 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 here. That, that's basically what we do for the vehicles that we service. Because oh. it is overwhelming. Yeah. Even a new vehicle is overwhelming, much, much less a new concept. If you've been building NA engines where they probably tell you what valve spring you have to use for 150 years, and you're trying to figure out turbochargers where you get free horsepower by pressing a button, <laughs> it's going to be overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. All right, well, uh, in my effort to change, to tr switch gears for one second, we have a really good listener that um, we've known for a while now, and he, I can't name him because his friends will kill him, but he wants to know, um, if you're looking to get into a 2J, um, mm -hmm. what's a good starting point? He's asking about VVT versus non, you know, pros and cons for both. Um, give us your, you know, your, your best advice on somebody's first 2J. That's kind of like saying if I wanted to get into a small block Chevy, you know, should I do a short stroke 427, 388H? Should I do an LS? Should I do an iron truck block? It's not that bad, but it's it's kind of tough. Like if he's if he wants to go make 1500 and build a drag car, then don't worry about VVTI really. Just put a 2J in it. In reality, it might even be better for your racing program if it's on a budget if you use an na head a ge head yep. because they're so much cheaper you can get them for like 50 bucks 200 bucks they're super cheap whereas a gte turbo head will run you 
thousand to fifteen hundred, um, and that's used. So it, a lot of it will depend on the budget. If it's just a guy saying, "Hey, I'd like to have a two J Z powered streetcar that makes good power," I would definitely recommend VVTi. I had that on <clears throat> my last Supra, and it was it was just plain awesome. A uh, lot more power in the mid range. Um, a lot more fun to drive. Uh, absolutely, uh, a great a great program. Any modern ECU um, will be able to control the camshaft. There are great uh, camshafts available. Uh, Brian Crower makes some. GSC makes some. Um, so really, no downsides from back in the day when you couldn't get any aggressive enough cam uh, to do anything with, and none of the computers knew how to drive the camshaft. So now it's really a lot of upside. Uh, I, the only way I would say not to do it is, again, if it's just a race motor, it's not really necessary because you're never at 3,000. Right, right. Okay, that's probably all he needs to know. Where, I mean, where do you find a, He needs a, more. Just have him contact me. You know, I can I can walk him through everything that he needs, and, and I'll be happy to help. Okay. Do you guys have cores that you sell? No, no. Yeah. I hoard my cores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I bet. Yeah. Okay, so the next question, like, where would you look for one? Uh, I guess you're not going to tell me that because eBay. That... Oh yeah, yeah, they're all over Craigslist. Okay, Facebook. Well, that particular engine was in quite a few things, wasn't oh, yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, it it wasn't like it came in no. one car. No, it was in a lot of stuff. Till well, the 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 turbo two JZ wasn't in very many. Uh, the the non turbo, the two JZ GE was in basically every Lexus for about 15 years mm-hmm. and the non-turbo Supra. So that one's very easy to come by. And, and and those are fine to make really good power, right? I mean, you yeah, don't want to. Yeah, there's, there's no problem with them. I mean, they, they use a different intake and exhaust manifold. So when you go down that road, you're probably going to be committing to one because you're talking about a three or $4,000 change to your program. If you wanted to move to the other cylinder head, but otherwise the block is, interchangeable only difference really is oil squirters and an oil feed for the turbo but that doesn't really matter uh the, you can use a head gasket head studs are all the same you know main caps crank all that stuff's the same so uh no real problem to use that the early ones that aren't um that are not coil on plug have a distributor so you have to be careful when you do your exhaust manifold or else the turbocharger will run into the distributor on the passenger side but no, no real issue using the uh, GE engine. Okay, and are, are they? I mean, can you make a thousand horsepower with those things? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to make a thousand with either one stock. It has been done, but, but if it's built, yeah, no problem at all. Yeah. Okay. All right, that should answer him. All right, Mike, you can go back to your insane amount of power from, isn't it, a, a small package? Yeah. I know. And like we always joked about it, like, oh yeah, my, my wife's car makes a thousand. <laughs> you know, like that's how it is now. Yeah, car does actually. Make <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think everything his <laughs> wife owns makes a thousand or more. That the it's really a pretty crazy time. Well, I mean the the variable valve timing. I think that that's got to be huge for everyone involved. I mean that that and and especially I mean for the import guys that have separated exhaust and intake camshafts, that opens up mm-hmm. a lot of possibility. For the domestic guys with the single push rod in the or a single camshaft in the middle, it's a little tougher because you're just moving center line or you know installed center line. But that sounds like how involved do you guys get with that stuff? Is it is it uh, uh, working essentially like a switch that an RPM we're going to move, or is it constantly varied depending on the situation? It's constantly varied. Uh, if you get two or three more steps, or if you get two or three steps more technical, it'd be a better question for Jay who does all of our tuning, but, okay. um, it's constantly variable, but it, it's exactly how you would think, you know, there's different, uh, different overlap works better at different RPMs. You know, the, the same thing that we've all told everybody the whole time we've been doing this is every camshaft is only optimal at one particular RPM. It, it's the same thing. You just get more RPMs now because you can move the cam a bunch. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, good. Go back to your, you, you done with turbos? Well, uh, see the, the problem with the turbo things That's is, about turbos. yeah, there, there's so many questions. Like, I mean, you know, what you asked them about, uh, the gen two stuff, you said that they used them actually on the two Jay-Z's, 
uh, the 64, like 66s. Oh, the precision. Gen yeah. Like, and, and here, here is like a perfect thing from a guy on the outside looking in. If you have a T4 exhaust housing or a T3 mm -hmm. exhaust housing, or let's say that particular turbine housing, a V band, you know, on both sides, turbine housing. Why does it, it, I mean, that is just the connection point, but it also seems like it's more than that. The, the, I don't know if I'm framing this question correctly, but obviously, I know where you're going. yeah, you know what I mean? Like it's confusing. Say is a 0.83, the same as a 0.83 is the same as a 0.83 across all the different housings or how does that, how does that actually function? Well, no, because the, the A in AR is area. Okay. And the, the area is of the volute of the opening. So that opening, when it's smaller, the, the, the AR changes a bit. I mean, the, you know, back in the day, and I mean, by back in the day, I mean like 12 years ago. Well, like 12 years ago, everybody used to think that at roughly 1,000 horsepower, maybe 1,100 horsepower, you have to move to a T6 or what Precision calls a T5 turbine housing, which is, you know, the larger flange that you see on a lot of big trucks. Uh, because they just simply can't cram enough air through that T4 flange. Well, that's not entirely true. Like we we have a we've made over 1600 wheel through a nine inch and a TH400 on a single T4. Um, you know it. You can make a lot, a lot of power on a single four. The uh, ETS GTR, I believe Tony Paulo's GTR. Uh, I I think both of those cars are two T4s making roughly 3,000. So again, that's another good 1,500 horsepower per turbo example on T4s. There's some Evos and Hondas out there with really nice T3 turbos making about 1,000 wheel through a T3, I believe. So it, it, it does matter, but it's not, it's not going to make or break it. Like, um, I don't want to... I don't want to sound like I'm brushing the question aside, but you have so much larger decisions to make when it comes to the proper wheels and then also your upgrade path. Um, but when you're, when you're saying I want X power with X engine size, uh, the flange will virtually never be what you make your decision on, uh, with the exception of, okay, let's say I have a, um, let's say I have a, an Evo and I want to make, you know, 800 and see how it feels before I move up. Okay. Well, for that guy, I would say, start with a T4 because now you can move up, you know, forever, essentially beyond ever, wherever you'll ever go don't use a T3 because you're already close to the end of a T3. You know, there might be some exotic ones that you can find, but pick the T4 because you can get the same turbos with a T4, most of them, and then you have a much easier upgrade path. But other than that, I wouldn't let the flange hold you up. Just match the wheels and how the wheels are going to perform on that engine side. Yeah. And that's, see, like, that's one of the things when we were talking about this in the very beginning, like precision in that one particular line they offer a T4, a T3, and a V-band. Um, right. And I don't know, like I asked a very specific question from the exhaust housing side, what is your V-band housing? Because it's like T3 has become an area. Uh, th this is the flange area. Well, what is the V-band housing most similar to? Is it between a T3 and a T4? Is it a T3? Yeah. And it, they... They internally, I don't know if it's internally or if it's advertised, but they, they internally call their small frame, well, very small frame T3 or V-band stuff, the T3 V-band. And then the 70 turbine wheel and the 75 turbine wheel, they call a T4 V-band. Uh, so to answer your question, at least from their standpoint, they look at it as a T4 interchange once you get to the 6870 and larger and a T3 interchange when you're talking about a 66 turbine wheel and smaller. Gotcha. That makes more sense. So they have two V bands, mm -hmm. two V band sizes. Of, yeah. Of exhaust yeah, housing. Yep. Well, there's, there's multiple V band sizes because there's also a pro mod V band, which is substantially larger. Oh, okay. So 
if, if there's anybody that's been doing turbocharging for a long time, um, the 66 Precision is akin to an old P trim. Uh, and so anyone that did turbos 15 plus years ago, a P trim is basically the size we're talking about now. And now you see P trim sized turbine wheels able to support over 900 wheel horsepower, which is laughable compared to when we were using P trims. It was like a 650 horsepower unit. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Got it. That actually cleared up quite a bit. Yeah. I told you into his stuff. Quite a bit. Hey, um, uh, we should, we should really shout, one of us should shout out to, uh, to your lovely wife, man, or we're going to get in trouble. <laughs> I mean, it should be you. I, I would do it, but it really should be you because you have to go home to her tonight. Well, uh, yes, I, I do have a, a lovely wife. Hello, Janelle. Yeah. Um, Mike's looking at me like I'm crazy. I, I happen to know his wife very well and, and, and okay. she, and she deserved to be shouted out. Okay. Too. Well, I'm, I'm not looking at you like you're crazy. Yes, you are. I'm no, just looking at anybody married like they're crazy, but that's just me. I mean, I'm, yeah, just, I'm a little different. That's actually true. Um, <laughs> so, uh, listen, tell us, uh, tell everybody how to get a hold of you guys and, and all your, all your contact stuff. We're easy. Um, we have basically any method of contact that you guys want. Um, uh, call us 407-695-7223, uh, realstreetperformance.com. Uh, we are on YouTube, uh, Real Street Perf TV. Uh, we're on Instagram. We have uh, all of our build advisors have um, company cell phones, so you can text in your orders. International customers can use WhatsApp. Um, a lot of our guys are constantly answering questions or orders or helping with advice at all hours so we're really easy to get a hold of okay greg banish just asked if you guys uh, see smoke signals anywhere which i thought was pretty funny <laughs> anyway yeah, we can probably figure that out i'm sure you could um all right well listen man we we appreciate you coming and uh and all the info and uh you know hope everybody out there dials you up and and uh utilizes your service and your stuff yeah i mean you can't you yeah. can't go wrong anybody listening if you're looking for good you know people with good knowledge of what they sell they're not just people putting parts in a box these are the guys you got to talk to because that that experience well, is hard to get we have um we have a video series that we do called jay's tech tips where we we just you know do a lot of that conceptual type stuff uh where it's it might be on one particular item or one particular engine, but it's all about teaching the guy so that he can, so that he can learn. And, and again, not to rehash it, but feel empowered. So uh, if you go look at our video series, it talks about everything from selecting the right bore size to nitrous fail safes to, to a variety of different topics, you know, uh, clutch switches and valves and, and all sorts of stuff that you probably didn't know at one point, maybe, you know, half of it, maybe, you know, 90% of it, but most of the guys I talked to, if they've watched a bunch of them, they said at least one or two of them taught them something new. So we try to give people the information. Uh, we aren't secretive. We, you know, that, that's, that's our value proposition okay. is, to, is to share the knowledge with you. In my, in my entrance into tuning and learning about measuring and logging and everything, did Jay have a video that specifically talked about flex fuel and lambda yep that was them right yeah about lambda i don't know no. if you talked about flex fuel but i think I, I thought it was about flex fuel because like when it when you did something like when the content changed but it was it was referencing lambda as to why you should use that rather than an air fuel yep and i'm sure that's what it was i'm sure it was a real street video yeah yeah it, uh, i would i would i would buy that i don't remember the particular one you're talking about but I, I can vaguely remember something about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I know it was because I sent it to you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, you should go, everybody should go check out the videos too. I, I've watched, this is one of those things when I get into YouTube loop, we've talked about it. I end up with people getting chased on motorcycles by the cops. I don't know how it happens. <laughs> Every time I go there, that's where I end up. But <laughs> if you're, if you're looking for a particular information and you run across something from real street, watch it. Cause it's going to be accurate. No doubt. All right, Mark, again, uh, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank you a bunch and, uh, hope everybody calls you. 
All right, buddy. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks man. See you. Fun, See you. Bye. See, I feel bad with this stuff because I don't know enough about turbo. I, I don't want to ask questions because I think my questions, a lot of them are going to be kind of stupid. Well, he, I, I mean, everybody in chat said it seems like he knows more, you know, real world turbo stuff than turbo guys we've had. On. I know, but uh, the, the problem is, is where I, where I am in the, in the scheme of things is like asking, you know, where does the exhaust hot stuff go? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Magic, I'm just the magic wind. Yeah. Mean? Where does the, where does the, the bad stuff go and where does the magic wind come from? Mm-hmm. It's. Well, I, I like where you put the one, the, uh, you know, three liter motor as compared to a six is that two, three liters. So you can make it like that, you know, consider it. Is yeah. it going to make the same output horsepower wise, but except for the RPM. Right. Well, I, but, you I, th- know. I think probably any engine builder that's trying to figure out something they've yeah. never done before. They, they try to maybe put it into a factor where they can, one you know, one they could look at you know? yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, but like, this is what we were talking about when we were talking about little turbos for the truck. Right. Mm-hmm. Like what, what would you really need for, for what power level and why would one, I, I still think I'm missing a little bit of the puzzle here because if you had one housing that would pass X amount of horsepower, that means you move that much air into the motor. You've consumed that much air and it has to move that much air. You have to produce that much more exhaust gas, but does that scale? Based on, and I know it's air over time because horsepower is torque divided by, uh, torque times RPM divided by 5252. So it just, it to me, I don't know that if you got one motor, it's going to make power at 9,000 and it's half of a V8. Do you understand where I'm going with yeah, this? Yeah, I do. I do. It's, I need to learn more about well, it. Well, I think, yeah, but I, I think it's, a, there's a, a variable scale in, in what you're talking about. Uh, will a, a six liter motor make exactly what two three liter motors will make? Uh, probably not, depending on the three liter motors. I mean, you're talking about an engine that has, you know, dual overhead cams, so it'll be a little bit better. But I think what Mark was saying, and I and I agree 100, percent is that you can you can you can line it up pretty well based on the, the pumping mm-hmm. amount of the engine and get yourself close. Yeah, it's never going to be right because I mean. You know, you put a good, a better set. I, of think, heads. I think what it might be is that we're oversweating the details. Yeah, I think like so. that this gets you close. Yep, yep. But you're I, not, you're not going to be perfect right off the bat. But no, you, but you've never oversweated the details. No, <laughs> I never do that. <laughs> never, never obsess about anything. Speaking of obsessing about stuff, nobody's probably going to hear from me for a week. So you're all going to get a pass. There's not going to be any more Trump memes or anything fucked up getting sent to you guys because of the gentleman I have on the phone now, Mister Banish will be responsible for keeping me in front of a TV for probably the better part of this week. Mm-hmm. Good. So he he's on with us. Hey, Greg, how are you? Hey, can you actually hear me this time? Let's, yes, yep. we do. <laughs> yeah, you're good. <laughs> okay. Uh, surprise. I'm, you connect. It's, it's like the biggest irony in the automotive world right now because it should just be you don't connect. It's a very sketchy balance on this thing. Of, of all the things I love in this car, the radio is not one of them. Dude, Mike hears that shit all the time because that's what I, I have a Durango. And I mean, we talk on the phone and I'll be cursing, you know, it's disconnected. You hear, you hear it's not the, in the distance. Oh, hold on a minute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't no, get I, I want to walk downstairs and find the, the release engineer for this Uconnect 8.4 and punch him in the nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, give him one for me too. Cause I, I feel your pain. Yeah. At least you guys have that. The exhaust guys did a wonderful job on this car and they offset it with the radio. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. So what should I know about uh, about these videos? Because you were very quick to point out today that I jumped to the advanced, you know, tuning one <laughs> without the, like, is it? I bet you it walked through the door, and if he looked at when I was looking at it, it couldn't have been more than a half hour, and I'm already sending him pictures of what I'm watching. And he goes, right to this too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> of course. I admire your enthusiasm. It's hard, it's hard to tell you to, you know, slow it down, but... Uh, Usually, I, you know, I get guys asking about this stuff, and they, you know, everyone, if you ask them, everybody's advanced, right? Oh, man, I know how to tune a car. Tad's advanced. Show me this one little thing, right? But the funny thing is, like, the more complex the combination, the more complex the control system, the more the fundamentals matter. And I'm shocked at how many people, trainers included, miss on the fundamentals. Mm-hmm. Right. It's just very basic stuff. Like, you know, we spend a lot of time as tuners in a community looking at our wideband and adjusting a VE surface or a math curve, right? Because that's what the wideband says. And, you know, aside from whether they're using a 
piece of garbage wideband or something they can actually believe or they put the sensor where they can believe it or, you know, have any air leaks in the system or other mechanical issues, guys just can't be bothered to put injector data in. Like, it's not that hard. And so disk one has a long explanation of why you want to use known fuel injectors, right? And I'm kind of glad I don't do end user tuning very much anymore because it's always a pain in my butt. You know, guys are like, well, can't you just? No, I won't touch your oddball fuel injectors. You're basically, your options are an OEM injector that I have the data from a CAL file or something with known good data. Like Paul Yaw's injectors are pretty good, right? All his data is pretty much spot on. There's a handful of others. I got, I've got a set of injectors on my Corvette that came from Zip Products where They've got 1832 data, and it's plug-and-play right into the GM units at GM pressure, and it dropped right in, and things go right where I point it. You know, as a calibrator, you, you want to calibrate. You want to point things somewhere. You say, hey, I want to go to Lambda 0.91 and watch the wideband go 0.91 with no correction active. Mm -hmm. That's how you know you're in control. And so if we don't get the basics right on fuel injector or – how we would log a Lambda error against MAP and RPM, then how can I explain to you the process of correcting virtual VE based on equations and coefficients? Yep, your initial foundation is wrong, so you're, you're really fighting it. Yeah, I, so I, I always end up spending a lot of time sweating the basics, and guys are like, oh, that's all theory, it's all nonsense, you know, real tuners don't need that. I'm like, um, yeah, math applies to everybody, guys. <laughs> yeah, we... We race a quarter mile, not eh, kind of sort of over there, right? You know, guys want to know who crossed the line first at exactly one quarter mile. You know, there's some math in that. So, you know, math matters. how do we, you know, handle our engines? We, we put a number on it. That's what engineers do. We put a number on it, and, and the math isn't really hard. I mean, it's, it's a lot of multiplication or addition for the most part. I mean, we can... All the stuff in my classes, and even in the video you're watching, Mike, it, I mean, you can do that math with your smartphone, mm -hmm. right? You can do it with a solar calculator if you had to, right? Yeah, no, yeah, and, and so far, crazy. like the stuff that that I've seen, uh, I I'm gonna I'm gonna go through these from start to finish. I think that I I had the benefit of maybe not having to filter through some of the internet noise because I could talk to people right off the bat. They would be like, no, 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 don't do this, do this. Like immediately, like, no, 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 don't look at air fuel, look at Lambda. And I think that was a, a big head start, especially when looking at the flex fuel stuff. It gave you a better handle on what's really happening chemically. And I, I think that with all that, I, I think that probably foundationally, I'm probably better off than I thought I was, but I'm definitely going to start from the beginning. I went to, to this too, because I wanted to know a, a couple specific questions I had about virtual volumetric efficiency tables. There were a couple of things there that I thought were were pretty interesting, and I wanted to know how they worked. And honestly, in five minutes, I had almost all of them answered. So that was nice. It was real good. Yeah, it's funny because that virtual VE thing doesn't exist in the ECU, right? It's not there. Yeah. It we have to do post processing. So HP tuners and EFI Live are nice enough to run those equations and spit out the values in this surface, this 3D surface that we can, as humans can look at and go, oh, let me move that area up or that area down. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's in the ECU. It's just coefficients. Right, right. So they have to have this solver to go from this mythical surface that you've kind of sculpted and corrected based on the errors you saw and dial it back to a number that the ECU can process. And the funny thing is, like, you know, it's, it's building blocks, right? So we had disk one and disk two, which you've got. And Dave and I were just recently, I mean, like literally weekend before last, we're filming Gen 5 stuff. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It's still in there. Right? GM didn't completely reinvent all their virtual volumetric efficiency just for the direct injection engines. They basically carried it all over. They just changed one of the units. And so we had to capture that on when we film it and we're going to explain it very thoroughly and show some practical examples of it at work and show how it relates to the stuff that you just watched in the advanced series on the gen four engine. Mm -hmm. So we're going to hopefully make that easy for other people to understand. So they're not afraid to do virtual VE 
on an LT1 or an LT4 or L83 or whatever you know their favorite DI engine is. Okay. I think those DI engines are going to be the future here. Yeah, yeah. I guess they're they're, they're probably not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. They're here. Hey, so Dave is your I mean, partner. They got rectangle ports. So Dave's your yeah, partner. Yeah. So yeah, he's the one who's been kind of lurking in the in the uh, chat room. There, he's got the two J in his scamp, which yeah. is why he's probably pretty interested in what Mark had to say. We're, that scamp, we're not really even leaning on it yet. It's just you know, it's fun. It's a good demo. The, it, the car's a head turner because it's something really different. But it's a lot of fun. You know, what year is the car? As much torque, seventy one. Oh, that's so cool! So it's like a dart. Yeah, it's on the cover of the, yeah. <laughs> the DVD. Yeah, a dart with a two. Yeah, and it, you play. Well, it's on that Blu-ray. Yeah, so in the Blu-ray, you'll see us in that car filming. It's got a MS3 Pro, and you'll see us tuning it. it. It's just one of our demo cars. It's just you know, it's just another engine to us. It's it's all pink in the middle to me. I don't care. You know, air, fuel, spark, whatever. Dave did happen to mention that when he gets tired of talking to you, he blames it on your Uconnect. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, uh, I hung up. Sorry. Yeah, I'd be like, hello? I yeah. can't hear you. Yeah. Huh? Hello? <laughs> <laughs> well. All right, well, here's what I'd like to do, Mr. Banish. Um, after I go through, you know, maybe the first disc, uh, maybe get you back and we'll talk about it. I mean, how do you want to do it? Do you want to... You want to talk to me after I've done through? No, tell tell me what you think people want to hear. Yeah, you know, I think everybody <laughs> should watch all the. Everyone should order three copies from <laughs> DetroitTechnicalMedia.com dot com and uh, have them on hand. One for home, one for the office, one in the car. Right? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, people from from what I saw, like I said, just wanting to know some specific things and knowing that you know, having a conversation with Greg the day before or the you know last week. That oh that disc is perfect for you. We do exactly that. We talk about virtual biometric. We talk about scaling. We talked about all the things that I knew the term, I knew the principle, but I didn't know exactly how or why it applied in the computer. Cleared all that up. Yeah, pretty there's quick. The key words right there, Mike. How and why. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Dave and I focus on when we're doing video production. So many guys will take your money and and tell you what. Yeah. Just, oh, well, just zero that out and just, you know, just plug this number in. Oh, you know, LS, you know, naturally aspirated LS1 is like 27 degrees of watt timing. Well, what happens when it's different, right? So what I want to do is tell our students, what are you doing, right? How does that system work? How did it come up with 27? You know, it's this plus this plus this. And why is that second one in there? You know, why do you have a different number final versus what the high octane spark advance had. Well, you know, they've got adders for temperature, they've got adders for lambda, and those are in there for a reason because there's physics behind that. You know, the flame speed changes. You know, things happen at different rates, and so GM being pretty smart, they account for it. And zeroing it out in the calibration table doesn't make the physical effect go away. Mm -hmm. It just means you're not going to account for it, you're not going you're going to pretend it's not there. Yeah. Which you know, in real life doesn't work. So it, it's the difference, like, you know, drag racers are like, well, I don't care. I just, you know, I just want to run down the quarter mile. I'm like, well, what happens if you had to qualify in the afternoon and race at night? You know, would you care then? Right? You know, would you, you know, if it cooled off at night, would you like an extra two degrees of spark advance knowing that the engine wouldn't get hurt and it would make a couple extra horsepower? Sure. You know, is that desirable? No, well, that, that to me, all of this is exactly what the, these are the questions that I've had. Like I have talked to people about this stuff and it's just kind of flat out. Well, just do it this way. Why? Well, it's involved, but just do it this way. Well, how come I do it this way? So the next time that I run into this problem, I understand how to do it. Most people were not willing to answer those questions and either they don't know the answer or they just don't want to take the time to tell you. I, I mean, Everything has a why, and I, I'm very much the why guy. I want to know why. Yeah, and, and that's what we're, we're trying to answer that question in all of our training material, right? You know, I know everyone loves that it should be free and, you know, it's all over YouTube, but, you know, kind of some of that you get what you pay for. So I, if I'm going to charge somebody for our training, then we better deliver. We better really answer the question for you. Okay. So that's always the challenge for for us is to put material together where we're actually answering a useful question to you. Well, this is a perfect timing 
and it's going to be great for me to learn because the turbochargers are going to start going in my truck momentarily, <laughs> and there's going to be a, a lot of things to do that are all going to be involving what I can learn from this particular set of DVDs. So DVDs and Blu-ray. So we're, we're definitely going to have you back on. We're going to go through all this and talk about it. I mean, for sure. I think it's, I think you're going to like that actually, because the virtual VE demo in that second disc is my twin turbo C6. Mm -hmm. So it's going to look a lot like what you're playing with. Okay. Right. And the neat thing is that the controller below 100 kilopascals doesn't care that the turbos are there. It, it changes nothing. You just have to use a, a two-bar virtual VE calculator, and I show you a couple tricks to make sure your first guess isn't off in left field. And then after that, you just collect the data like normal, and you know, we map it steady state at 120 kPa. Yeah, I saw that. Boy, does it indicate like, the reason in the video for a good steady state dyno facility. I mean, that really... Oh, yeah. Uh, this is not something you can do without a steady state dyno. Yeah. So, I mean, I've done it on hubs. I've done it on AC dynos. I've done it on eddy currents, right? You can do it on a water break. So, I mean, but you can't do steady state on an inertial only. And it is really hard and kind of stupid to try and do it on the street. You yeah. Know, the guys are, oh, well, you know, real, real racers don't, you know, don't race their dynos. I'm like, well, General Motors does. <laughs> yeah. Right? All the... All the wide open throttle mapping in Pontiac is done on a steady state engine dyno with no car attached. It, so, and their cars seem to run fine. So, I mean, it's just a matter of dialing up the right conditions and being able to be consistent about the measurement. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, I, I was actually going to talk to Tom about that, knowing where I want to bring the car to use the dyno that, that would be suitable for doing this. So now, now this, this is all going to be really There's good. Lots of them out there. That's the cool part. Yeah, this is going to be a great experience, and this is exactly the reason I bought this little truck. It was just for this, to, to learn exactly this. So th this is going to be good. I'm very excited. Crickets. Oh, crickets. That fucking you connect. Uh, no, I'm, I'm reading, like, Brandon was asking, how does the Advanced Series differ from uh, GM-specific DVDs? And the Advanced Series, to answer his question, the Advanced Tuning Series, the Blu-ray, is what we consider to be the universal truths that apply to anything with hydrocarbon fuels and spark plugs. Hmm. So the, you know, you'll see that one's divided into four different episodes or segments spread across those two Blu-rays. Uh, the first one is all the setup on the ECU kind of preventing problems before they can happen. Second one was fuel and chemistry and fuel systems. So, it, it kind of doesn't matter what the badge on the side of the fender is, um, whether you're driving a GM, a Ford, a Honda, Toyota, BMW, whatever. I mean, we, we buy gas at the same pumps. So there are some lessons you have to learn about gasoline and even ethanol that are kind of universal. Uh, there's an episode on nothing but airflow measurement, so both MAF and VE, but it's not GM-specific. You won't see GM v virtual VE on the Blu-ray, but you'll see steady-state VE mapping and steady state math curve stuff. And then there's another episode on spark advance because mm -hmm. the concept of MBT translates to every engine. Okay. So, you know, somewhere, you know, at a certain speed, load, temperature, and air fuel ratio, there is an optimum timing point and retarding from it has a very consistent effect. And sometimes that's a desirable and sometimes it isn't. Yeah, well, like I said, we're going to talk about all this stuff and I'm not, I'm not going to, there, there's no way that I could relay enough information to people to be like, huh, I don't need to buy the desk. <laughs> you, you really, like I said, unless for some reason or another, and I mean, I'm going to be honest about it. If there's something that I feel that I couldn't pick up from this, I'll tell you. But from seeing what I saw already in the brief window that I jumped to, to learn specifically about like those two things, you know, VV and scaling, there's no doubt that every question you have is going to be answered here this is going to be a really good resource for somebody if they buy it, if, if they want to know more. So, all right, great. Yeah, and it's a lot to digest in one setting. Yeah. You know, I, I sent you all, you know, I sent you two discs and a Blu-ray and the books and like, you know, that'll keep you busy for a while. I don't expect that our customers and, you know, our friends who go out racing sit down with a bowl of popcorn and say, man, I'm going to sit down and watch two hours of technical instruction, start to finish right now, and I'm going to absorb all of it the first pass through. I, I, I'm an idiot if I think that's what they're doing. So the cool thing is, is you know, giving to them this format, they can watch a little bit, 
pause, stop, go do something else, clear their mind, come back a little bit, watch a little bit more. Hey, man, let me rewind and watch that again. I know it's a lot of information. We try not to repeat ourselves a lot. So you'll see it's not the same exact stuff regurgitated. And you've got hours and hours of video instruction there. Okay. So, I mean, I know it's not the cheapest training out there, but I hope we give you guys some real value. Well, I'm sure it's going to be worth it. I'm Sounds, sure. Looks like you do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, this is a uh, matter of fact, <laughs> when we were sitting here in the studio, I was trying, there was something I was right in the middle of watching when Tom got here. I'm like, shit. <laughs> and I was trying to see if there was a way that I could watch it on my Mac, but Mac doesn't have quite yeah. the abilities that other computers have. I'm like, ah, fuck. Now I got to wait for the show to get over before I can get, but I'm going to go back. I'm going to start at the beginning. I, I saw what I needed to say, and now I'm going to start from chapter one, disc one, and move my way forward. So, but thanks again, Greg. Okay. I really appreciate it. No, I'm glad you guys are, uh, like it so far, you know, just, like I said, if you got more questions, but, you know, we try and put as much as we can in here. And I even students, I don't do classes anywhere near as often as I used to. And I just tell guys, look, you know, if you can get the video stuff and just sit down and watch that, I bet you most of your questions are right there. And if you, you know, then if we do a class and you come to a class after having seen the video, you've got some really pointed questions and we can dive deep into something specific. Yep. Right, and I'll get you more for your time that way. Okay. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, like I said, I'll, I'm sure I'll be in touch. I'm sure I'll have a lot of questions and then we'll figure out which week is best to schedule you in. And yep. then we can spend a lot of time on it. I think it'll be great. Yep. Great. Well, hopefully by then Dave and I will be a lot further into the gen five stuff. We, we get into that. I'll, I'll make sure you guys get a chance to see some of that moving forward, but we're still a little ways out on that. Okay. A lot of work. Apparently it's, it's kind of surprising how few people in the industry are willing to talk correctly and deeply enough to describe the DI systems functionality and not just regurgitating the same internet wisdom. And, and just so to, to point out that some of this, that some of this direct injected stuff you were doing was actually down at Howard's, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. We, I filmed a lot of it there. Yeah. And so, but I've been doing DI for years. I mean, I've over a decade. I was back in 2000, Six or seven, I was doing a gasoline direct injection turbocharged V8 proto for Ford. It never saw the light of day, but I mean, we had we had a 5.4 liter F150 with twin turbos. It was kind of neat truck to drive around. Well, I would imagine. Hmm, okay. Well, so I mean, but you know, the concept doesn't change, you know, and there's actually a lot in common between PFI and DI, and you got to learn how to apply it. Okay. But, I mean, we're talking, you know, the stuff that we filmed at Howard's, we did some really cool stuff with high pressure pump control that I don't see other people doing anywhere in the industry right now. So we're just going to put it on the, on the video and let people learn how to do it the right way. No, I think all that will be great. We explained and... the whole idea of start of injection on DI because it's different than PFI. So. All right. Save some for later. All right. Great. <laughs> Thanks for the time, guys. No, we're right, gonna brother. we're gonna get into all this stuff, and I, I guarantee you tonight uh, will be the start of this. So we'll see how far I can get and what I can pick up. But thanks again, man. But we'll get it all scheduled to get you on here, so yeah. we can we can have a good conversation about all this. Yep, we'll get them on. Okay, tell your listeners if they uh, they want to play along with you, they got to go go to DetroitTechnicalMedia.com. dot <laughs> com. Dave's got all the this posted up there. He can, you can set it. We we can get them all out to you ASAP. You guys can play along together. It'll be a fun game show. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Everybody go get it, and then I'll I'll quiz people that call in. There you if go. I can get these sissies to call in. There you go. <laughs> all right, Greg, man, thanks a lot. Hey, thanks, guys. All right, See thanks. You. See you, man. All right. I I think it's going to be really good. I do yeah. too. There's Jeez. a lot of lot of educational material out there if you're if you're willing to spend a little bit. I mean, look, this stuff's never going to be free. No, you, you know, it's going to be very hard to get the level of information that you need in the granularity that you need for free. It's not it's cool happen. that he's, he's him the and his two of you motherfuckers. All you've been here. doing is yawning all day. Yeah. I look over it's at hard. Tad. He's yawning. I look over you. You're yawning. And I'm the guy who's getting the flu. It's late, man. <laughs> yeah, you're going to give it to us or whatever, but <laughs> I hope so. I, I, hope. Got two, I got two quick things for Tom too. Uh Oh, first one. Cause you probably know a little bit more about Mopar than uh, Mike here, but it, an A body. Wow. Yeah, a dart and a barracuda are the same animal. So, what do you think? A two JZ and a barracuda, as opposed to a 
third gen Hemi with the blower. I would definitely put a two J in it. Yeah, without a doubt. And the second one, something I found, I tripped upon on Google Images search. Since you're a watch person, okay. There's a guy out there that or a company. They make a they take a Bugatti W16 block, okay, and they make a watch winder out of it for your wrist watches. Yeah, I have one. You have one of those. It's a hundred thousand dollar wristwatch winder. Uh, maybe that's not the one. <laughs> I was going to say, you motherfucker, you got a hundred thousand dollar Jamie to wind your watch. <laughs> I'm looking at him like, who the hell? And and they're, they're thought I bought stupid shit. <laughs> and they're talking about this wristwatch, and then I looked. It's like, well, Costco sells more expensive wristwatches than that. Why are they naming that, or they're getting paid? I don't know, but that was just an well, interesting thing. It's on not. It's on nosleepatall.com. If anybody wants to just look at it, so look at that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah look at us, right? Yeah, self-promoting. Or okay. Good God. job. Good job, Ted. All right. God, yeah. Anything else? We didn't even really pick on FUD today. And boy, I got a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that poor guy. There's not enough time for that. Well, I, I told him I'd help him, you know. See, programming requires a little bit of logic. I think that's might where his train might leave the track. <laughs> Defin- <laughs> definitely. <laughs> we'll go over that in our time. All right. Well, we'll see everybody next week. Uh, and uh, thanks for listening. See ya. Yep.